Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman of the Milken Institute, Michael Milken. Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> we have a very important session here this afternoon on the credit market outlook with five of the leading investors in the world in credit uh, today. And as we've discussed, the search for yield. So for the next hour, the search for yield is going to stop right here <laughs> with these five individuals. So Jim, you've built a big platform, a diversified platform today. Tell us how you've structured Apollo today to take advantage of opportunities around the world in credit. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, I've been at Apollo now 12 years, and pre the crisis, it was probably very similar to what we all recognize in, in terms of taking advantage of dislocations and QCIPs. Um, and then there was a period of time during the crisis where we were fortunate to have a lot of long-term capital. But since the crisis, we have focused a lot of our time on uh, permanent capital vehicles and origination front end. And while um, you know, our, our great success is certainly what we've done with Athene in creating that business, which is now a $60 billion public company, um, but um, certainly whether it was mid-cap on the origination side, what we've done with Amerihome on the mortgage side, so really having origination businesses so we don't have to be a QCIP buyer uh, in a fairly valued world. I think that's been critical to our business. And having the permanent capital such that we can use bouts of volatility in 11 and 12 and last year in the first quarter, that's been, very, that's been really the key to our success long term. So, Joe, your firm has particularly focused on different forms of investment to get an incremental return. Structured products, today, trust preferreds, in other periods of time, you bought annuities, et cetera. How do you build a culture, and how are you structured to do the credit work to look at many, in some cases, esoteric securities? Yeah, you know, I think that from our perspective, you know, Golden Tree is a global credit manager. Um, and, you know, the playbook, uh, we think that there's uh, a lot of interesting things, obviously, in corporate credit, but... Um, we see value uh, globally uh, in emerging markets, distressed and structured. Um, you know, in terms of kind of the opportunity set that we see like right now, um, emerging markets are, you know, are, are very interesting. Um, a theme that we've played many times over has been relationships between quasi-sovereigns and, and, and sovereigns. Um, and uh, if, you, if you maybe to use a slide real quick, I know it's early, but just to, you know, slide 41 um, is, is an interesting slide that shows something we're doing today uh, that's, that's particularly interesting uh, in Argentina. Uh, Argentina is an improving situation. The credit statistics of the country are good, but if we look sort of a little bit uh, away from the, the sovereign, we can see that a, sovereign, a, a, a province like La Rioja is literally 400 basis points over the sovereign. Um, and that's something that we expect spread compression to happen on and could be great value. Um, likewise, we see these types of opportunities in distressed and, and structured products. I can talk more about those, Michael. Your, your question was more about building the team. Um, and it's really about having uh, a key set of uh, extremely well, um, you know, sort of seasoned and, 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 and strong professionals in these different areas because the, the, the opportunities change. All right. Michael... Should I call you Michael or Sir Michael today? What do you think? No, no, my, Michael will be very Okay, good great. Yeah. All right. So every single person in this room does not know it, but they wish they had 100% of their money with you last year when you generated a 30.5% rate of return. How does a firm such as yours at CQS, which has a real expertise in worldwide credit, et cetera, how did you generate a 30.5% return last year? Yeah, well, uh, so some of my friends might just say I, ju I just got lucky, but the but the reality of it is that it, it, it was looking at the uh, at the macro in assumptions that were going into why people why the markets at the beginning of the year were going into uh, into meltdown. There was a view that China 
and this was, was having some real problems. Uh, again, we, we, we manage money for it, out of that part of the world. My view was that that just was not going to happen. It was, it, they could have had issues, but problems, no. And uh, the other thing was that uh, there was a view that uh, oil was going to be falling out of bed totally. And again, we can talk, look at some slides later, but oil at $10 a barrel, the, they, could, they just can't pump it. it I mean, we'll, we'll be pumping uh, 50 million barrels a day rather than 90, 90 million barrels a day. We just can't pump that, that stuff. So what I, what I did at that time, took down my hedges, my, my risk, uh, chief risk officer was looking at me very strangely every day, probably more like every hour. I took down my hedges and we, did, we had enough fundamental work around the names and we just doubled up uh, the, uh, the, the bets. And the key is, of course, to make sure that we right sized it in the beginning. And uh, there, there it was. I guess um, it's just being, being understanding the context and then being aggressive about ba backing the fundamental credit work that allowed us to do that. And, uh, th there, there it was. So I was waiting for you to tell me today, Michael, that it was because you were a, on the board and a trustee of the Vatican Bank. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and it was divine intervention. Well, <laughs> it, it, it certainly did feel like divine intervention, but the, uh, <laughs> as, as you, you're quite right, Michael. I, I am on the board of the, uh, the Vatican Bank, but... Be aware, there's, as, as with all things, there's more than one Vatican li library, there's more than one Vatican ar archive, and there's actually, frankly, more than one Vatican bank. But I'm not on the bank that, uh, that has, the, uh, that, that has the, um, the IOR, which actually looks to the, the outside world. Uh, that's been, been cleaned up rather uh, dramatically. It's subject to money val. There are other parts of the Vatican which are not subject to money val, so there we go. So are we allowed to deposit money in the Vatican bank? No longer. That, oh. was the, that, used, to be, that used to be the problem. But... Uh, it's a, quite an austere hall. I mean, you've got a cross, you've got the other thing. It's, um, it's, it's like a banking hall. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and they have a vault, Michael. Now, the oh. other thing I was hoping you, you would have told everyone in this panel is the insights you received at the Global Conference in 2016 uh -huh. were a very important part of this outperformance. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I say that to you that uh, it's certainly formed part of the, uh, part of the context. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no question. I mean... One of, the, one of the things I will say about this is that uh, this conference, you can't get to, to doing proper investment without having imagination. Look, the problem is we have at the moment is that knowledge is a commodity. Let's be clear. There's lots of stuff out there. There's lots of machines out there. There's lots of Bloomberg's, whatever. Knowledge doesn't get you there. You have to have insight. And the only way you can go there is by having the, uh, the imagination. And to be very open with you, the stuff we do day in, day out, at your conference, is, it provides the Im imagination. I must admit, uh, I, I do well, try to do, do, do it elsewhere as well, but <coughs> well, that's a big deal. It does require imagination, and it's going to require fortitude if you want to get on and go to the next star system also. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, George, you often talk about the credit cycle globally. How do you view this? How do you do the work? How does your firm react when you project what that credit cycle might be? Well, I, I think an important piece for us is <clears throat> we've been in business in 25, for 25 years, and we always took an approach of trying to create an integrated platform that was in the public and private markets, could be in corporate, real estate type of credits, uh, and had a broad geographical approach. Because I think the, the key insight for what, us is you always wanted to find credit trading cheaply. And, and you had to be positioned to do that. And there's only a few areas in the world where that happens at any point in time. And so we, we try to take that relative value look across the globe and, and operate as one platform in doing that. And then, of course, in execution, I mean, you, you have to do your work. Uh, but it's really a lot about complexity. So I, I think it's interesting. I know you, you raised the issue earlier, Mike, about active, passive, uh, uh, credit approach, and I mean, our, I think a lot of our approaches here is really about complexity approach, because that's the way you can get some excess return. So, where are we in that credit cycle, in your opinion, today? Well, w we think about both the credit cycle and then the ensuing default cycle that can vary, and I, I, I would have told you a year ago that it seemed like we were a lot closer to being in a much dire spot, and, and since then, of course, spreads have gone uh, narrowed back down, uh, defaults have actually settled back down to about 2%, 
other side of it is uh, a lot of underwriting statistics have worsened. Uh, but our view is, is that we kind of muddled through for another year on, in the credit cycle, but it's getting long in the tooth. Uh, and so we'll see how that looks in 2018. So Mark, uh, you've just raised a new fund. You probably raised money faster than you ever have before. And it was probably the largest fund you've ever raised. So you've True. You've had both those things, and as you look at the change in your limited partners and the structure, what did you experience in this fund? And uh, what Mike's referring to is we uh, closed at your end on a $4.6 billion mezzanine fund. I think we benefited from a number of things, uh, 25 years of experience. Uh, chief of them and a, a track record with that and uh, a terrific sourcing platform. Uh, but that said, I think we were the beneficiary of very low interest rates around the world. Uh, as we actually heard yesterday at, at lunch with Dr. Kim, you've got $78 trillion uh, of liquidity in the world and it sounded to me like half of it is at zero or marginal interest rates or in cash. So with the global thirst for yield, we found, uh, to our pleasant surprise, two-thirds of the investors in this United States focused, although we do make some foreign investments, United States focused mezzanine fund, uh, two-thirds of the investors were, were foreign. And uh, we're very pleased about that. And um, actually, interestingly, Mike, we've been able to see several of them at your conference here. And uh, so it's, uh, I think it's reflective of what's going on around the world. And you call this a global conference, it, it truly is one, and it's a privilege to be here. So, Mark, I think it was about a decade ago when you told me the last time you heard everything was going well was the summer of 07. <laughs> okay, so we're kind of coming up to the 10 year anniversary. How are you preparing yourself for that 10 year anniversary? You know, J.B. Diamond yesterday talked about how bankers try to look around the corner for a problem, and, and credit investors, which we've done at Crescent our whole lives, that's all we do. Pretty much all we do is look for problems, and we're scratching our head looking for problems now, and that's what makes me nervous. Uh, probably the thing that's the, the biggest concern right now doesn't have to do with the capital markets per se and away from, you know, obvious geopolitical risks is you have an uh, increasing amount of consumer debt in the United States and uh, some slight cracks in either subprime auto loans or uh, to minor extent uh, subprime mortgages. You know, but all that said, the magic of low interest rates doesn't turn any of those into a problem. So we'd be very concerned if there are going to be some, a series of interest rate hikes. And I, I know a month ago preparing for this panel, uh, the panelists here, we all talked a lot about that. And uh, all the leading indicators today is that we're not going to have a series of interest rate hikes this year. And one of the other panelists said, you know, we'll kind of uh, muddle through this year. I think, uh, Creston, we use the term grind it out. We are grinding it out every day, either squeezing basis points of extra yield in our public portfolios or making an extra call to source a private transaction. So let's take a different approach with each of the panelists. Um, a half a trillion dollars in private equity was raised in 15 and 16. Good chance that more than 500 billion will be raised this year. Jim, your firm alone, I know, would like to raise the whole 500 billion, but maybe you'll settle for 25 billion in this fund. Uh, if we take whatever we're going to leverage here, at the least, it would be two to one. It might be substantially more. So we're going to originate, private equity is going to originate over a trillion dollars if they deployed this money over a period of time, backing up, raising $500 billion a year. Uh, today, they're able to leverage, depending on the situation, six to seven times. Uh, no covenants, no maintenance covenants, and pretty low rates. How does this reflect in your portfolios today, Jim? And I'd like to ask that same question all, for all five of our panelists. How are you structuring your portfolios if we're looking at a potential of trillion dollars a year being issued without covenants, without maintenance, and at pretty low rates? 
Well, I think, Mike, that's exactly why many of the practitioners up here and certainly at Apollo, while we understand and see what's going on in passive versus active, many of us in Apollo especially, we preach and focus on active. Um, it's the ETFs, it's the large uh, mutual funds that are exposed to the capital coming in because of quantitative easing. They're the folks that are buying the large uh, perceived liquid and, and large capital structures and high yield that are typically uh, done in, co in coordination with the big buyouts. And, you know, certainly if you look at the large HYG or the large ETFs right now, we would argue that um, the names that are exposed in those are purely the largest issuers, not necessarily the best issuers. So the whole argument about active versus passive in the equity markets, you know, coming into credit, that's a, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, certainly when one looks at a traditional portfolio, we all know why private equity is raising the capital because it's the one area of opportunistic returns that in a low or no rate world, private equity is getting allocations. But the financing behind those, if your credit business is uh, constructed to finance those buyouts, you're going to have a tough several years. So we, we, we look at it, the world very, very differently. And I'll, I think it does play into the credit cycle. Certainly, we've all experienced quantitative easing uh, across all asset classes, and that, that sort of takes up the value of a lot of assets, as we've seen the asset bubble. I think as we transition, the big question we always get asked is, when is this credit cycle going to end, or what's going to happen? And I think when you transition from a quantitative easing environment to a fiscal, away from monetary and into fiscal policy, that's when there's really winners and losers, and that's when there's a variety of sectors that, that might not win, and whether it's what's going on secularly in retail right now, or in specialty pharma, or in the utility sector, that's when you're going to see a credit cycle. But the reality is that your, your basic question is about high yield and these buyouts. That's why you don't want to be in passive over a cycle in credit. Joe? So... There's two parts I think I want to talk about. Um, one is just, you know, I think where you were hinting at with regards to the leverage and the lack of, of, of uh, credit protection uh, and lax underwriting standards. Um, so when we look at that, we've seen that, and it's typical in a cycle that, that credit standards, you know, become looser towards the end of a credit cycle. <clears throat> one of the things we do think that the market is somewhat missing on the bank loan side is that you know, historically, uh, the percentage of the capital structure that bank loans represented was about 60%. And today, it's running around 75%. So what does that mean and, you know, to us as, as an investor is that you know, we should expect recovery rates to be lower. Um, we should expect volatility. Uh, but that's good. That's good from an active management perspective because that's what we're really you know, brought on to figure out is you know, the capital structures that work, the companies that work, um, and make sure that we're investing from a, from, prudently from a risk-adjusted perspective. So that's one fact, is that we, we should expect that, that there's going to be you know, volatility in the, in the asset classes. But another, the, the part you, know, you asked about is how do you set up for it? Um, and that's something we're, we're very excited about. Um, and it came about through regulation. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a part of Dodd-Frank called, uh, it's a, it, that requires risk retention for securitization. Um, and that's something that went into effect uh, December 24th of 2016. And um, we, uh, Golden Tree has been, uh, you know, a pioneer in the structured side. We've been issuing, you know, uh, structured products, you know, since, since 2001. We've been investing actively with technology on the investment side since 2007. That's given us an edge. But now we had this regulation come up where it required the sponsors to retain a certain amount of their, their capital in, 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 in these CLOs, which invest in bank loans that often come from leveraged buyouts. Um, so we looked at it. We've, been, we've generated great returns, and it's a product. CLOs have, have survived the crisis, went through a, a default cycle that was uh, quite, quite strong during the financial crisis, 13% default rate, for example, in, in 2009, and came out with double-digit returns. Um, we looked at it, and we said, okay, uh, you know, is there a silver lining to this regulation? And um, we were, uh, came up with a lot of interesting ways to improve that model that gave, you know, really a, a benefit to our investors. Uh, ways to um, 
design it so we could improve on the warehouse uh, aspect of CLOs, ways to improve control of costs, um, a few other tweaks that we think are worth probably hundreds of basis points of additional return versus what we saw historically. So uh, the, the slide shows some of the benefits, but looking at you know, some of the, uh, the, the, the effects, we're well into execution mode already. We issued our first CLO in our risk retention vehicle that we raised uh, in, in April. We saw that we got the tightest pricing uh, over, since the past four years. We were able to ramp with 90% of our collateral at, at closing as opposed to what used to be the model of about 40 or 50%, and there was a lot of negative cash drag as a function. So anyway, the point is, is we've got a vehicle now that's set up and well poised to invest in the bank loan market, but prudently, but under our terms, um, and in a way that will deliver value for, for, for our investors. So um, we believe in, in credit, clearly, and it's one that we think that we're poised you know, kind of to, to, to get value in. But having the right structure that can access the market and invest in the right companies is, is, is how we've sort of set up for it. Uh, Michael? Yeah, well, I mean, again, clearly, with, with, with these current, uh, current issuance, we have to work a lot harder. And it's, uh, it's actually quite, quite interesting. It's, it, and hard work here will be will paid off. We are not an ETF. Uh, that, that's, that's, the, that's the really good news. We are active. We, our team does a, a good deep dive into the, uh, in, into, into the companies we're, we're working in. And again, you have to keep working on that, uh, that deep dive. You can't just do it once and then hope, uh, hope it's fine for the rest of it. Every month, the guys uh, re review it, and I'm, I'm sure that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, something that's uh, pretty common across the, the panel here. The reality is this uh, sort of issuance actually plays to our strength. The Covenant Light uh, work allows us to do well. We've, uh, we've also uh, run, run CLOs, whatever, and uh, our, our, uh, our um, default rate is, is less, less than, than most, and uh, frankly, our recovery rate is, is higher than most because we do the we, we do the homework, and uh, you know that's the that's the bottom line of it. There's nothing like hard work. So I, I, just a couple things to paraphrase, Michael, what you just said. One, I think across the board on this panel, you're looking at fundamental analysis, credit work, bottom up, etc. So this group, for example, is not buying credit because it was issued from that standpoint. Two, I think one of the points you've, you've made here uh, is that you particularly view this as an opportunity. Yeah. And it's quite possible this large issuance uh, of covenant light uh, paper will potentially drive up rates eventually or create opportunities for you in the future. George, how do you view this? Well, if we have a trillion dollars of high yield issuance, covenant light, low interest rates, uh, ultimately it could be a very beautiful thing. <laughs> and uh, I think our job is one, to stay out of the way of it, uh, two, to, to understand, the, make sure we're up to speed on the industries and really understand the covenants and the relative position to see when there's either a chance to buy the paper cheap or maybe ultimately default it. Mark? Well, to <clears throat> pick for a moment on what George was saying, in the, in the speaker ready room uh, meeting with Mike, we, we all sort of are rooting for a little bit of a correction uh, because I, I think we all, uh, at least on this panel, have the, the stomach and, and the discipline to figure out how to take advantage of that. Uh, but you know, prior to this and the first round of questions, we all talked about how everything is kind of low default rate and you know, an index with 5.6%. We do a bunch of things. First of all, uh, having been trained by Mike, there is, you know, no interest in buying a low interest rate bond with no covenants. And uh, our firm has been organized uh, in order to be able to take advantage of a lot of the uh, investment disciplines we have so that we don't get relegated to that. So half of our business is investing in private transactions. We reviewed over 1,300 last year. And specifically in those deals, you get to structure the transaction, diligence the transaction, and name the interest rate. And if any of those don't line up, then you don't make the investment. Separately, we focus a little bit, not to the extent that Golden Tree does, I don't think, but we do focus on structure. Uh, we think structure is a way you can take advantage of the markets, both in terms of 
buying structured assets that folks don't understand, and separately st structuring around transactions where you can make investments to make things more favorable. Mark, let me ask you a quick question. Sure. How do you possibly do 1,300 different transactions? No, we look, we've reviewed. reviewed. Okay. We, have, we have 80 investment professionals, and uh, you know, it's, it's one of the uh, challenges, I think, for uh, when we think about the maybe relaxation of uh, uh, regula regulations and the banks getting back into uh, the lending business, that's fine, but you've got to have people to go and make those investments and dig those transactions up. So we had 80 investment professionals who looked at 1,300 deals last year. We actually select less than 5% of the transactions we review based on this discipline credit process. So. The, the private process takes you out of this uh, morass that the public markets from time to time find themselves in. And separately, because we do have a high yield bond, public high yield bond business that does need to compete in the markets and beat benchmarks, increasingly we've had to be more thematic, focus on you know, when to make a credit bet, when to make a duration bet, when to take a look at central bank policy, uh, and went to, you know, frankly, we talked about uh, energy and retail up here. Energy is 15% of the high yield market. You must have a view on energy and commodity prices in order to uh, run a public high yield bond portfolio. Retail, by context, is only, or comparison, is only 3%. So unless you've made a lot of really bad judgments in overweighting retail, when the whole world knew there was a sea change in retail, you don't have to worry about retail that much. And so we increasingly are using a thematic approach, all the same credit skills you've discussed, Mike, but a thematic approach to managing our public portfolios. Jim, you, as much as any firm I know, under your leadership, have done a number of things in Europe. You've bought credits, you have people on the ground. Uh, in many ways, you've acted as a bank, non-bank bank, in purchasing bank assets, et cetera. How has that experience been for you? Well, I think it's, um, when I think about Europe, and I remember being on a panel here five years ago when the discussion of, of Europe was at a much more tenuous point uh, in 11 and 12, um, you know, we, we had a view then that, that the euro was going to stay in contact, um, in context, and, and we, we really backed up the truck in terms of a lot of performing credit and structured in credit in Europe in, in 11, 12, and 13. That worked out well for us. Um, I think that market is rich right now. I think it's incredibly rich. Um, I'm not a big fan of direct lending in Europe, which I'm happy to talk about. But the biggest area for us in Europe the last five years, last four years, has been in our principal finance business where we buy uh, non-core assets and non-performing loans. Uh, and as you said, we bought uh, Bank of America's credit card platform in Spain and Ireland. Uh, we bought a, a variety of insurance pools and, and uh, a bank in, in Spain, um, a variety of real estate in Germany. And that's where, when we see the European theater and an 18 trillion economy with 45 trillion of banking and finance assets, we think that's a, a sandbox where you want to play right now, where you can find a little bit of value. Um, and I think, you know, dollars a day, we're, we're much more heavily weighted to the U.S. versus Europe. Um, I suspect, I personally think that, that Europe is having, you know, surprised by some of the, the positive views, but I think Europe is, has a, a much bigger issue confronting it with regard to the euro in, in, in May of 17 than it was five years ago. But again, we've done it not in QSIPs. Uh, we have a little bit of bank debt. Uh, performing debt, I think, is hard. I think direct origination is very hard, but it's really been more the non-core assets and NPLs, Ireland, UK, uh, Germany, and Spain. Jim, if, if you thought about your transactions during the year, what percent do you originate or reverse inquiry? Well, across, I mean, Mike, we're, you know, the, the credit platform of Powell today is, is fairly large, $125 billion. Uh, surprisingly, 75% is really more performing debt. Um, but in our direct origination business, really mid-cap uh, and our BDC, um, we're either the lead agent or a clubbed agent on 85% of that product. Um, 
Now, on the broadly syndicated side, it's a different business, but really in our direct origination business, and that's just about feet on the street, you know, mid-cap when we bought it. It had a billion five in assets and 40 people. Now it's seven and a half billion and about 130. And it's not just leveraged loans. It's a variety of, of products, ABLs, revolvers, life sciences. And again, that's, that's the big theme we've done in Apollo. You would not, we've not, we would not have been able to grow if we were counting on the banks to provide QCIP product for us. It's just, it's not possible. Um, and, you know, that, that being said, I think there's a, been a lot of, Growing in place. When you think about what you've had to gross invest with repayments, it's uh, it's tough to have marginal dollars at work. But um, I I will add one more thing, and I know I've been asked this a lot in the audience by people at various meetings. I mean, we're all close to credit, so we see we feel how rich it is. But when you travel around the globe, when you go, in, when I went to was in Japan last week, you know the ability to generate six to nine percent. Uh, it, what I think is our strong attachment points, not ETF high yield attachment points, that's a relatively strong asset return uh, in a world, in a zero return world or a 1% world. So I think that that's what's led to credit being a more, uh, a broader asset class rather than the traditional is high yield cheap and is it time to, to allocate to distressed. So, Joe, you talked a little earlier about Argentina, emerging markets, etc. Uh, at our gathering today, we've been very focused on uh, trying to present a much larger contingent here from Latin America, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, etc. And I know you've been an active in emerging markets for quite a while. You spoke briefly about Argentina. Would you like to talk a little bit about your experience in Mexico, which obviously the stock market was one of the best in the world, had a good performing market, and their currency has had significant rally this year versus the dollar? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in um, emerging markets, it's, you know, I think the, it, it's, the, it's a broad opportunity set, right? So sometimes it's, it's in uh, hard currencies, sometimes it's in local currencies. Um, and it's not just in Argentina either, as you, you, you know, you mentioned. Um, you know, last year we were uh, one of the things I think I mentioned in, in, in this panel was uh, a Brazilian relationship. Same thing, quasi-sovereign. It was actually a, a province there called Minas Gerais, and um, that one was actually guaranteed by the sovereign and was trading 300 over the the the, the sovereign, and uh, that since collapsed and and we got out of it around 100 over. So that was that was a good double-digit return. Um, we, we saw similar types of things, interestingly enough, in Spain uh, in, you know, in, in, in 2012. And I think um, one of the things I, I'd like to point out to everyone here today is every single person on this panel has talked about buying non-vanilla credit. And so whether you're going to move into Spain, whether you're going to move Mexico, Argentina, wherever you might be moving in the world, you really have to have a team. And, and one of the things, I, I want to just come back in a second, Joe, that Michael pointed out. The significant difference for many years between a bank and one of these active money managers is a bank might make a loan and you have a bank loan review two times a year. Uh, some one times a year and, and at most maybe quarterly. I think what Michael pointed out to you is they're looking at the credit on a continuum. They're constantly looking at the credit in a significant way, and that's what active management means from that standpoint. Joe, let's go back to yourself. And one of the questions I'd like to address, are you buying just U.S. dollar, or are you taking currency risk by buying other currencies? Yeah, I mean, most of the time we're taking it's U.S. dollar, um, but there are opportunities in local currency too. Um, if you think, you know, and this is, uh, again, where you've got to have uh, experts that understand the local dynamics, the central bank dynamics of that country, um, where you, we know we do see some opportunities uh, in the local currency uh, just as well, and that that we've uh, done. Um, but it's, I'd call that an accent, not not sort of the main driver, um, but but certainly one where you know when you talk about expanding the box and, and trying to find uh, investments that are not passive, um, these are areas that you know can can offer that value. Um, you get lots of flavors. Uh, you know, even thinking about like Pemex is, is just an interesting one, right? We think it's, it, you know, Pemex is Mexico to us, 
It's the largest uh, corporation there. It's, it's owned by the government, employs the most people, um, but has uh, something like 50 different securities. And, 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 and then you look at, uh, outside of that, multiple currencies. So, and you're talking about across the curve. Um, so there's a lot of ways, um, you know, uh, George mentioned complexity as a way, but you know, there's just, de the debt market has got a lot of flavor, and you see a lot of distortions that happen. Um, sometimes it's because of, you know, sort of rules-based investors. Uh, it could be indexes, index followers. Um, it could even be CLOs, uh, where you get sort of distortions um, that create, you know, these opportunities, and that's where, you know, active management, in our opinion, can, can really, um, you know, you can find things that are, that are mispriced, even in a, in a world like today's where, you know, credit broadly is tight. So, Michael, I know you have viewed geopolitical challenges and volatility. Yeah. You know, I know you've been a student of this most of your life. I know you hired a geopolitical strategist a couple years ago. How do you view the geopolitical area in making your investment decisions? Well, actually, there's a slide 29 to give you a sense of how messy the, this, this can be. Uh, but uh, the, the, the reality is there's a process around all this stuff, as, as always. <laughs> it's not just uh, having a, uh, a couple, of, uh, couple of drinks and just sort of kicking back and thinking about it. I mean, you've really got to, 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 to work around this. And the real challenge is, what is the transmission mechanism inside all this thing? The reality is, you look at, uh, you look at Europe, there are some real challenges in terms of populism and whatever else. The reality is Spain is doing just fine, the economy. It, uh, Ireland is doing just fine as well. I mean, there's no... You know, it, but the, the reality is if you look at some of the Brexit points, the Brexit points, which, you know, that's still not all over, by the by. And remember, France did vote for... Uh, to, not, not, not to do the, uh, the Maastricht thing initially. They, they voted in... At, they had to vote twice not uh, to, 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 enter the, uh, to, to enter the monetary union. So, look, for my view, that's not all over. There's a probability around them not, not, not getting there. You have to think about that. And what we use around that is to say, okay, let's think about the probabilities. Let's see if it's undervalued and then, and then try to put, uh, put some value to that. And, frankly, you can go around the globe. You, you, look, at, you look at Russia uh, at the moment. What's going on there? Uh, at the moment, it's it's not, no 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 big deal. But let me tell you, when the when when Ukraine heated up and there were people talking about s uh, switching off uh, Swift, you could have taken something down the whole U European banking system. Now that's that's worked its way through the through the uh, through the um, system. So the bottom li bottom line of it is that we use this as an, an extra string to the bow to try to make the excess uh, marginal return and to try to make sure we we get away from the uh, from the, uh, from the, um, if you like, some of the some of the time time bombs that are out there. I mean, by the way, let me give you one time bomb at the moment. Iran is becoming a lot more active in the Red Sea. Think about that. That's not a good deal, potentially. Uh, again, forget about the Straits of Hormuz. The Red Sea might be the next thing going on. <laughs> Who knows? So, George, you know, you have focused on many areas specifically to build up an expertise at the firm. Maritime being one, mm -hmm. small balance mortgages being yep. another, real estate. How have you developed that expertise? What type of staffing do you have? And how does that come to play in your portfolio construction? So, I mean, there's a couple ways I'd think about that, Mike, but I'll start out with the notion that there's a, there's a lot of liquidity out there. So what we're trying to do is find a space we can exploit, has some complexity to it and some excess return. And uh, one of those areas uh, has been the smaller balance commercial real estate mortgage area here in the U.S. and in Europe. And, and what's describe what you mean by small balance. Well, call it $5 million and less, uh, sometimes up to 20 You buy them in portfolios. But the key is to own, you know, you have to, the origination is a challenge. You have to be disciplined in pricing. You know, you bid on a lot of deals, win a few. Uh, and then you need to own some servicing capacity. So by that, I mean capacity that has the capability, you know, not just to act as, as the underwriters, but to actually grab hold of the mortgages, the pieces of paper, and restructure them. So one of the funds that we raised, uh, I suppose humorously, was named the Scratch and Dent Fund, because most of the mortgages that we bought had a little bit of hair on them. They weren't purely in default, and you needed an ability 
to uh, work them and turn them in a little better performing piece of paper. So we've done that. We have that capability in Europe. Uh, Jim mentioned earlier about uh, the non-core assets being sold there. There's probably a trillion of, of non-core assets still on the bank's balance sheets uh, that's selling off at a pretty good pace, you know, 80, 80 billion a year. Uh, and that still creates opportunities. But you need the servicing capacity and you, and you need the language skills and the workout skills requisite for each country. So maritime, obviously yep. there's enormous volatility there and yep. shipping rates in other areas. What sector, if any, are you across the board in maritime? Well, we're, we're really across the board. Uh, what I would just say is, is that uh, we're, we're focused on the debt side, uh, where there's been a pull bank back in traditional bank financing. Uh, and then, you know, we really tried to think a lot about the valuation, come in at a low LTV, uh, have probably focused mostly in the uh, smaller container space, so you've got to be very specific on what type of assets you invest in. So there's a large ownership of loans, which my guess is they'd like to liquefy in Europe. On the shipping side. Yeah. Yep. True story. Has that something that you've been looking at? Absolutely, but we have yet to see it come at a price interesting to us. I mean, that's the big thing I would say. That supply of loans has been around for four years. I think we've probably all taken a look at it, and it's, it's never gotten off at a price that got interesting. All right. So, Mark, let's talk about you've been one of the lead mezzanine lenders for 25 years at your firm. If the marketplace is, is willing to accept six to seven times leverage, what's happening to that, quote, mezzanine uh, piece if that's coming in first and second lane? And how is your negotiation? Because I know you've taken equity pieces along with mezzanine. How are those negotiations going with the private equity firms today? So I'll handle that in two parts, Mike. Uh, relative to the leverage multiple or what you know, Jim Zelter referred to as an attachment point, We've been very disciplined in our firm across all of our portfolios to keep our leverage multiples down. So I believe in our, our mezzanine fund, we are on average, even in the current portfolio, inside uh, six times leverage. And the question is, well, how do you do that? One of, one of the things we try to do at, at our firm in, in all of our strategies is not take on too much capital so we can be selective. So we, we therefore can pass on transactions that are a too high a leverage multiple. Uh, and instead what we do is sponsors often come to us because of 25 years of lending in the business. Uh, and they're, let's say they're going to be doing a, a series of add-on acquisitions. So Crescent's a good partner because they know that our firm will be there not only to make this loan but several other loans. Likewise, there might be a point in the capital, we're talking about the capital markets today, and the challenges today, you know, uh, in the, uh, in, well, frankly, this point in 2016, we invested seven to $800 million in our mezzanine portfolio uh, when the banks and the investment banks and other lenders were scared about what was going on, and we were able to get, you know, 12 to 13% coupons. So with and around that, as well as other special needs sponsors may have, uh, and we understand when, you, when folks are coming to us, they're coming with a, a special need. It's not easy. Uh, maybe there's a pro forma that's difficult to understand. But they're, they're coming to us with a need, and we can structure it properly, charge uh, an appropriate coupon. I feel a little, uh, I mean, I was explaining this to a new potential client the other day, and he, he looked at me and he said, boy, you guys are really boring. And I think that's been one of the... Uh, the successes or the reasons for the success in our business, we stuck to our discipline. Uh, we stuck to mostly you know, things that everybody in this room could understand, lending money to good niche businesses that we've really diligenced, and, and frankly, primarily in the United States. So uh, currency discussions and other discussions are things we don't really have to get into. Thanks, Mark. Um, Jim, you've recently made and underwritten a large commitment for a pretty good size dip for the Westinghouse bankruptcy. What are the resources internally that you mobilized for this? What was the work you were doing and what was the credit decision from your part? Uh, and was there competition from others to make this dip loan? 
Well, that was about about four to six weeks ago, Mike. And uh, you know, Westinghouse, you when you had your slides at lunch today of the the leading companies, uh, you know, many many years, decades ago versus today. Westinghouse, I saw, was on that list, a great American icon, and um, they were in two businesses. They were on, they were in a great business where they serviced and and operated and maintained nuclear power facilities around the globe. Um, but then they made a fateful decision a number of years ago to be in a second business where they actually, for a fixed-price contract, built nuclear reactors, um, which turned out to be a, a dreadful disaster business. Uh, it had a Japanese parent, Toshiba. Um, so we had been watching this quite, for quite some time uh, in our private equity business. Um, we liked the idea. You know, it was a complex corporate structure. Um, and you know, when it became apparent that the Japanese parent wanted to file before March 31st, uh, we quickly organized ourselves between private equity and credit um, and let, you know, led some dialogue with, with a few of the restructuring firms. But I think that's a great example today where, uh, again, and I, and I keep har harping on this concept, but, you know, passive managers buying an index would not have the ability to purchase something like this. So what we did is, I think many firms, when they were contacted, they looked at it as, you know, nuclear, Three Mile Island, not a lot of nuclear issuance in the credit markets, and they looked at it as a real distressed opportunity. We said, no, no, par part of a dip would be to really push those two nuclear facilities off to the side. Operating business had, you know, massive tangible value, uh, you know, great EBITDA generation, five to $800 million a year. Uh, 500 to 800 million dollars a year. So we did an 800 million dollar facility. Uh, we did it basically around 10 percent when you take in consideration LIBOR plus 650 and a discount plus a lot of fees. That was for a, really a one year piece of paper that can get extended to two. If it's two years, it's 12 or 13 percent. And I would argue, you know, back to what Mark said earlier, attachment point, we're basically two times levered this, on this piece of paper. So for us, Mike, that's that's the quintessential ability to you know, the, the banks were not really in it. The ability for us to step forth, a lot of other folks uh, partnered up. We said, we'll take all 800 million on our own. We didn't syndicate any of it out. I have enough vehicles that I could put that in. Um, and really that's what we, you know, I, I do believe that that's the business of the future. I believe that you're gonna see consortiums of the players up here, uh, you know, doing a variety of financing situations that in the past had, had been the domain of the banks. Yep or had, had been the domain of other players, and, and you're just going to see many of us uh, exercise our broad skill sets to do so. So, Jim, how long did it take you to do the due diligence and make the decision to uh, be willing it, it, to stand it, by and make this loan? In-depth, uh, five days. Five days from initial contact from the advisors, Wednesday night at 5 p.m., to Sunday at 8 p.m., uh, $800 million commitment. Uh, company filed Monday night, and it was approved by the DIP court, the, uh, the bankruptcy court, uh, that following Wednesday. So seven days from start to finish. $800 million commitment. And you, you raise a good point, Mike. Um, many other folks, most DIPs have a 13-week uh, valuation process where you have to submit to the court uh, a variety of financial metrics. And in trying to really understand the real credit risk of this business, I, I made the decision that this was, you know, because of the contractual impact of the operating and maintenance and service business, which were, you know, five-year contracts, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not going to cancel contracts like that so easily. Um, I gave them a, a 26 to 39-week window to come in compliance, and that gave them the runway. So that's, that's something that a normal bank would not have done and it really was, it was sleeves off our vest at the end of the day. Joe, you talk, we talk briefly about trust preferreds. I'm not sure everyone who is watching this online or with us today fully understands that strategy. Maybe spend a couple of minutes on what a trust preferred is, how it got structured, and sure. what the opportunity is. So um, what's amazing is we're now, you know, let's call it eight, nine, ten years after the financial crisis. And so... Um, you'd think that you know, most of the opportunities and legacy structure products are, are gone. Um, this is an area that's still, uh, still distorted um, and, and has created some, some, we think, great value. 
uh, one of those places where you think you can get um, really good yield, good downside protection, and then some really interesting uh, event-driven catalysts to, to drive total return. Uh, so what is a trust-preferred CDO? Um, trust-preferred CDOs uh, were issued pre-crisis, like since, you know, before 2007. Uh, it's smaller market, so it's a bit niche. You have to have the you know, right ability to source it. Um, ironically, a lot of it th that we've been getting has actually been coming from non-core banks, some European. So that, that still always surprises me that you see that uh, that's available. But what it is is um, just like uh, any structured product, you have a, a, a liability st structure that's, that's, that's sequential. But the assets, as opposed to, for example, in a CLO being high-yield bank loans, the assets are trust-preferred issuances in community banks in the US. Um, and these uh, used to be treated as, as tier one capital. So that was why they issued them. Uh, a typical trust preferred in a, in a community bank would be LIBOR plus 250. Um, but why would the bank issue it uh, is because they got tier one capital treatment for it, which was nice, but they got uh, you know, at, at, a, at a debt type yield. The FDIC, once the financial crisis uh, sort of happened, uh, really changed all that and made banks that were greater than 50 billion not be able to count it in uh, tier one capital. And you know, even very recently, uh, we've seen you know, um, banks call their trust preferreds that have been priced even at LIBOR plus 50 basis points. Um, so in today's market, where you have the banks you know, looking and can borrow it much cheaper than that, they're starting to prepay. Um, the, the, the slide that I wanted to kind of highlight to show that, you know, a very specific example and, and why we find such value is on is slide 43. And, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that the rating is messed up. Uh, this was a double A tranche originally issued, backed by Trust Preferreds. Um, it's double, it's A1 rated, and then double B. That creates distortions. The rating agencies do not do a good job of upkeeping uh, legacy ratings. They're not incented to. Um, we bought this tranche uh, at a price of 53, deep discount. There's not a lot of assets in the whole world that have these types of deep discounts. Um, this asset actually has long duration. Uh, so Mike, you said, you know, 8% would be great to get and get duration. These, these have durations of eight years. Um, from a spread perspective at 53, it's around LIBOR plus 568 on a, on a, on a, on a discount margin perspective. Um, but here's the, here's the key part. The way that the structured market always works is it'll price the worst. Longest assumptions can be made. But the downside protection is that you could take 52% of the performing banks that survived the crisis that now have better tier one capital ratios, better ROEs because the interest rate curve is up. And then, you know, Steve Mnuchin was talking about regulatory reform and ways that, that, that the administration is trying to do stuff, a potential tailwind. So with a potential reason for prepayment. So you have all these positives, yet still um, it trades here. And we think that from a credit perspective, it probably ought to be inside of 300 over. But with duration, that should be a, that's a double digit return. Now this has come in a bit even this year. Um, that same bond, uh, you know, is, is now probably in the mid-60s, but we still think it has, you know, uh, ten, you know tens of points of, of room to go. Um, key thing is being able to source it, to analyze it. You have to have the technology, you have to have the team, you have to underline, analyze the underlying assets. So that's, that's one area in the, in the structured product market that's still um, distorted that we're, that we're finding some value in. Thanks, Joe. Um, <clears throat> George, why don't you talk a little bit maybe how you see emerging markets or other opportunities, sir? Well, I think there's a slide we have on uh, defaults in the emerging markets. I think that uh, it was in the Milken slides. Hope Larry can pull it up. For well, he'll find it. Yeah, he'll find it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about the big default cycles. We talk about the big corporate default cycles, which had their peak greater than 10 percent in 91, 02, and 08. And we all of us trying to think where we are in that path to the next one. Uh, but, but one of the things that is, is really kind of regular and is on a little different cycle is, are all the problems in, in, in sovereign credits. And in the last couple years, uh, there have been very interesting opportunities. Uh, Joe mentioned them in uh, uh, Argentina. Uh, you've had Venezuela, Brazil, which, which isn't just a matter of playing it by, let's buy Venezuela at 30, but they can be quasi-sovereign credits where you can find ways to go long short and maybe hedge out some of the sovereign sort of risk. And I mention that as an opportunity because lots of times when we think about credit opportunities, I think this sovereign opportunities, which you, you can see here, it's probably the most reliable source of defaults out there, uh, is in sovereign debt. 
And I don't think we're going to see a cycle like we see in, in uh, the corporate area in the same way, but I think the way government balance sheets are over leveraged and our, our lack of resolve in solving these problems, I think we're going to just see over the next 10 years uh, a continued regular source of defaults in the sovereign space. Well, I think you would also say that good governance, good leadership, the same in corporate world, yeah. you're looking for. and. The dramatic change with the new government in Argentina yep. has brought a new look in their ability to finance. And obviously, Venezuela's credits, exactly what it is, we don't know today from that standpoint. But George, you're 100% right. And obviously, if you look over thousands of years, the worst credit has been sovereign debt. Whether that is reversed or not with global growth, time will tell from that standpoint. Michael, when you look at the world from the UK. How much traveling are you doing and how much different do you think that view is if you were in New York or someplace in the US? Yeah. Well, again, I mean, the, the guys on this panel seem to do a lot of traveling actually anyway, but, but, um, but, but the, the more, the, 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 the key is, you know, spend time in China, spend time in Asia, spend time in the Middle East. Um, that really is the, and, 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 and elsewhere, that I think it gives gives it quite a a strong international flavour to where it is because again the the themes the trends are global trends. I mean, it's uh, if you if, if, look, we're talking about rates for, for example. Um, you know, rates are they going to go up because of fiscal stimulus uh, and, and, and tax issues here in the here in the U UK? Well, uh, sorry, here in the US. I should say. I'm sorry again. again. Uh, in, 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 the, in the U.S., well, probably not immediately, but let's, be, let's not forget that, that you, know, you need to think about the fact that Chinese are selling some of their, some of their treasuries. Uh, the fact that the QE is going to be finishing and, and uh, Yellen will, will not be here forever. You know, there's, there's something going to go on with that balance sheet. You, we need to think about the fact that uh, in, in, in the ECB area, the fact that there's very, very good um, economies there, that those rates will start pop bub bubbling up. So, you know, you, you, you need to think about the world. You need to think about what's happening in China. You need to think about... So how are you elsewhere. structuring your portfolios, Michael, with potential divergent credit uh, decisions or uh, QE decisions in different yeah. parts of the world, Japan, Europe, the United States? Yeah. Well, I, it's, frankly, it's one of the things that really energizes me about coming to work is to actually think about this. We go in two directions. The first is doing what we talked about earlier, Heavy-duty fundamental credit work—that's that's what keeps you grounded. But the reality is having a having a trying to understand where the optionality is um, around the world in terms of uh, think because again geopolitical risk is by and large not well understood and definitely not well priced. So you, you look and you say, well, that looks interesting. That looks out of, out of whack, and then you do something about it. I mean, there is an element of opportunism about it, but again, you need to to systematically read, travel, think, and, and see, see where it goes. You know? So Mark, let me start with you on this issue. Yeah. Uh, I'm an investor, want to invest in one or more of your funds. I'm luckily to be invested in at least two already. Uh, if I felt interest rates were gonna rise, uh, how are you structured if I'm as an LP and come and ask you, uh, I think they're rising. I don't know how you feel about it. How much exposure do I have in my portfolios, depending where I'm invested, with you in rising interest rates? So we try to, uh, increasingly we have investors who are giving us the authority to put multi-strategy investment mandates together so that we can manage around duration. We have been wary of interest rates uh, for a while now. So in our liquid portfolios, we actually have a high income fund that has a 6.6% yield right now and a 2.6 year duration because we're trying to manage duration there. Likewise, in our mezzanine funds, since we directly negotiate with private equity sponsors, we haven't, and maybe we've left some money on the table in vintage six, but we've opted to try to have as much floating rate as is sensible and typically, in our last couple vintages of funds, it's 50% or more. So we think we're set up as investors for the risk 
uh, by going with floating rate. And since most of it's within our control, uh, I think that's our solution. George, how would you answer that? I think we largely think about both the duration and the complexity we're involved in, so we keep it kind of event-driven and a shorter duration. So obviously in different decades, if we looked at the decade of the 70s, interest rate risk was actually a bigger factor than credit totally. risk as, yep. as that went from that standpoint. So by keeping short duration, you've somewhat mitigated interest rate risk. As best we can, yep. Okay, what about you, Michael? Again, uh, the, the floating thing in, in loans, ABS, is actually not a bad way to do it, but again, it's a duration point. And one of the things which I like doing is I like looking at structured, using structured credit to, uh, to do it, so you don't have to think, think as much about uh, what the rate environment is, unless you want to specifically trade that rate environment. But I, I, I want to stay away from that if I can. Joe? We're focused on uh, you know, uh, you know, neutral duration because of the risks there, but uh, distress, you know, things that are event-driven. Distress is a great area, even though you know, spreads are tight. We're finding interesting things in directories and, and other areas where we've put hundreds of millions to work with, with differentiated returns. Um, there's uh, you know, floating rate so uh, if products. We if, we find, if we define distress for the audience, it's trading more on the underlying credit than a spread versus government. Absolutely. So. Much more on price, things where you're looking for some event, um, something's changing within the company. Maybe it's an issuance. Uh, maybe it's you know, management controlling costs. Maybe it's you know, directories going from print to digital, but doing it in a way that, that, um, you know, that, that is cost conscious and ROE driven, um, but buying in also at the right multiple. Um, floating rate debt. Uh, you know, so your duration's short on that. Some of this legacy structure products, which are amortizing down, um, you can find you know that same type of structure in the emerging market side as well. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways to control that risk, and it's one that we're we're, we're focused on. Jim, I know you have s so many different credit uh, options for people, but if a person walked in and wanted to know, wants to invest a lot of money with you, and is concerned about rising interest rates, how do you answer that question? I'd put them in two strategies, Mike. I'd put them in our direct lending strategy, which is uh, virtually all 100% floating rate uh, paper, or I'd put them in a, a, a large commingled total return vehicle that uh, has a 6% yield on it in less than two years duration. So we, we own virtually, we have a big platform, but we have on 130 billion, Mike, we probably have less than a billion dollars of fixed rate high yield. All right, so one, I wanna thank all of our panelists. I think you've seen in this panel the enormous expertise each of our five panelists has in credit. One, two, in a market driven by commodities, ETFs, CLOs, etc. In order to get incremental yield, each of them has devised different strategies in order to get uh, incremental yield. And lastly, there isn't a great deal of credit risk in these portfolios if interest rates rise. So, one, I want to thank each of you for joining us today and look forward to okay. seeing how the next year plays out. And thank, thank you, you for joining us today.